the height of South Park's popularity in the late 90s, Paramount Pictures released an adaptation of the show titled South Park. Bigger, longer, and uncut. And yes, the title is a reference to what you think it is. The film was produced by the show's crew alongside the second and third seasons of the show. That may be a factor as to why those seasons were as mediocre as they were, since the film is far better than anything the beginning of the series had to offer. I've said before that this film is where South Park went from being pointless and crude to being more poignant and hilarious. I cannot do it enough justice alone. So joining me today to help review this film is Gem Reviews himself. Thanks for having me, Nick. I've been meaning to talk about this movie for the longest time. It really was the moment Matt and Trey and the rest of the South Park staff proved that their show was a lot smarter than most people gave it credit for. It's filled with not only colorful commentary on topics like you'd expect from South Park, but also with tons of memorable moments from the show that many fans, new and old, still consider some of the best moments from this show's history. We'll get to that eventually. But considering how long the show has been on the air and how many moments from this movie still stand out, it's safe to say this movie highlights all the best qualities of South Park. Let's waste no more time and jump right into this movie, starting with the story. The basic plot of Bigger, Longer, and Uncut takes elements from previous episodes of the series, but significantly raises the stakes. Cartman, Stan, Kenny, Kyle, and his brother sneak into the R-rated Canadian film Terrence and Philip Asses of Fire, a cinematic experience that is non-stop swearing and fart jokes. In other words, the first thing that you would probably think of when you hear the words South Park movie. The boys begin to use the naughty language that they learned from the film, much to the dismay of their mothers. The moms band together to create Mothers Against Canada, a group that protests the film and eventually leads to a war between the United States and Canada. Meanwhile in Hell, Satan and Saddam Hussein are planning to take over the world once the blood of Terrence and Philip touch American soil. So it's up to the boys to stand up to their mothers and save the world from screwing itself over. Okay, this plot sounds like it makes no sense when I say it all out loud, but trust me, it's actually quite comprehensive and enjoyable. The film's themes of bad parenting and censorship fit in very well with everything that South Park stands for, and the movie does a good job making fun of them and pushing them to their extremes. Children's futures! You started a war, you have to stop it! To make them safe again! Hello? Our children are precious! Hello? We must make a stand now! Stop at nothing! It also gives all of the boys something to do. Cartman has to suffer through the V-chip implanted in his body, Stan is trying to impress Wendy, Kyle has to go up against his mother, and Kenny goes to hell. Which sadly is probably the most he's done up to this point in the series. Even the side characters like Mr. Mackey and Chef get their time to shine, and the film flushes out characters like Satan, making them more than just simple jokes. The story features a lot of elements that appeal to fans, but everything is introduced in a way that people who aren't familiar with the show can still enjoy it. The average moviegoer can get almost as as much enjoyment out of this film as a fan would, and that's why I feel this film really succeeds as an adaptation. Not only that, the movie has the typical ingenious writing you'd expect from South Park. There's so many clever portrayals that not only poke fun at certain groups in a subtle manner and pay some great homages, but they highlight everything that makes South Park more than just a foul-mouthed raunchy show. The portrayal of the devil, for instance, while entertaining and a threatening antagonist, is intended to be so evil and ruthless because behind closed doors, he's very soft and weak-willed. And the staff made an excellent choice putting him in a relationship with Saddam Hussein, one of the most feared and evil dictators of his time. Because truthfully, I could see Saddam being controlling over Satan. Also, making Satan a homosexual, while I could be stretching this a bit, is also a really clever jab towards how Satan would be because he's the Antichrist. One of the most well-known passages of the Bible is Leviticus 18.22, which says homosexuality is wrong. And since this is the passage that gets referenced more than anything by homophobic people, it makes sense that this would be his biggest character trait. That's the kind of subtle, dark humor South Park always executed perfectly. And the V-chip implanted into Cartman, while being a clever homage to A Clockwork Orange, is also done to send another message about the show itself. See, Cartman was the most memorable character throughout the show, seemingly because he was a foul-mouthed, eccentric, racist, evil child. And for the most part, he was where the majority of their quote-unquote toilet humor came from. But what they do here is they take that element away from him. Now he can't swear or anything. But despite all of that, he's still absolutely hilarious. So South Park was using this to show that their humor is not just based off of toilet humor. Every single character has a charm to them, and that's why people remember them. 
So as Nick pointed out, giving them all their time to shine allows the full charm of this show to come out. That's a good example of how this film really evolved the South Park franchise by being more than what was expected from it. Another great example of that is the opening sequence of the film. The first swear word is uttered five minutes in, and prior to that, this feels like another movie entirely. It really does. It's upbeat, it's cheerful, it's actually like a kid's show on Nick Jr. or something. And this is their way of poking fun at how people wanted their show to be, despite it being a TVMA show. Hell, even the Terrence and Phillip movie you can argue was them poking fun at the people who'd probably be seeing this movie, despite knowing the content is filthy. The audience has discussed a reaction to it, despite everything in it being exactly what you'd expect from an R-rated comedy, begs the question, why were you even watching it when you knew it was going to be like this? This topic was pretty relevant to South Park during the time this film was made. Since many groups of parents protested against South Park when their kids ended up watching it. They make this the driving force of the film, which is a good way to make fun of it. If I have one gripe as to how the parody was handled, I feel like the creators tried to have their cake and eat it too. They simultaneously make fun of parents who complain about R-rated movies, while also starting out their R-rated movie in a way that would probably make parents think that it was rated G. I know that South Park does this kind of stuff a lot, and it doesn't really impact the quality of the movie, but I do think that it keeps this film from being an absolutely perfect parody. Nick is correct, it's one of the few blemishes the movie has. Luckily though, they would make up for that with other perfect parodies. In fact, the majority of their perfect parodies in colorful commentary came from one surefire way to make sure everyone, whether knowingly or not, would remember everything that they were saying through song. Many of these songs are made to represent something that's been associated with South Park throughout its, at the time, short lifespan. But not only that, most of the songs are also used to further the plot and result in very important plot points. Blame Canada is about the parents who let their kids watch South Park, but instead of blaming themselves for letting their kids watch it, their kids start to emulate it, they just blame South Park. Don't blame me for my son Stan. He saw the darn cartoon and now he's off to join the clan. But it also shows the formation of Mothers Against Canada, which would cause the events that led to Saddam and Satan's rising. Kyle's mom's big fat <laughs> was used to once again openly mock how people saw South Park, but it also results in Cartman getting implanted with the V-chip, which would be crucial for South Park's victory against Saddam and Satan. And Quiet Mountain Town is used as an open mockery of how many parents wanted South Park to be like. But it also shows the boys seeing the movie that would be the trigger of all these horrible events happening. I agree with almost everything that you've said. The songs are by far the best part of the movie. They work well as not only fantastic South Park songs, but also as great Broadway tunes in their own right. With songs like Up There, it makes perfect sense that Trey Parker and Matt Stone would eventually end up making their own Broadway musical. The songs have a lot of subtle references to them too, like how Up There is basically a Disney princess I want song, and how La Resistance is a parody of One Day More from Les Miserables. The only thing that I disagree with you on is that all of the songs are memorable. Do you remember their prize of La Resistance that the mole sang before he died? The mole sang before he died? Right, I didn't remember that. It's forgettable for sure, but it's also the shortest song in the movie. And I still believe that all of the other songs, even the ones that simply consist of swearing and gay jokes, are worth a listen, even outside the context of the film. That's certainly true. I'd even go as far as to call some of these songs underappreciated for how smart and catchy they are. But that's not the only thing you can argue is underappreciated. The movie's animation is phenomenal. Granted, the movie had a $21 million budget, and... I'm sure that helped out a bit more than the budget they had on their episodes. Well, it probably isn't all that good anyway. Cartman, what are you talking about? You love Terrence and Phillip. Yeah, but the animation's all crappy. But they went above and beyond with it. The bombing of the Baldwins is wonderfully executed. The war of hell and earth is so adrenaline rushing. And there's, of course, hell. I mean, this representation of hell is one of the best representations I've seen. Even better than Futurama's representation. Yeah, I said it. Fight me about it. But it's simply wonderful. The visuals of Bigger, Longer, and Uncut stick pretty close to the show, which should kind of be expected for a film adaptation of a cartoon. 
but as Jem stated before, a lot of scenes have much more of a cinematic feel to them, and the construction paper textures that everything has stick out more than ever. There are even a lot of great visual gags, like Jesus appearing in a crowd of army soldiers for a split second, and one-time characters from previous episodes making cameos like Damien in the theater, and this poster outside the theater that advertises Mega Streisand Takes New York. I did spy an animation error at the beginning of the film. When Kyle's mom closes this door, it springs back into existence instead of properly closing. But that's the only error that I found, and otherwise the animation was pretty polished for what it was. I don't really agree that this interpretation of Hell is superior to Futurama's, but I love how it contradicts with the simple visuals the rest of the film has. The sequence where Kenny goes to Hell looks a bit outdated today, but I actually think that helps the scene stand out even more. In a positive way, of course. Before we wrap this review up, I want to talk about the only two problems I really have with this film. The first is the film's ending. After Satan kills Saddam Hussein with the help of Cartman's malfunctioning V-chip in a really cool fight sequence, the devil inexplicably makes everything good again. Everyone is happy and friends with one another and Kenny goes to heaven. It's kind of odd for South Park to end something on such a satisfying and happy note without any repercussions. I don't outright hate the ending since the reprise of Mountain Town that accompanies it is really enjoyable, but nevertheless, it wraps the film up too quickly and too easily. I guess I could see that. If I could offer an explanation for that, though, it'd be because of how South Park wanted to portray Satan. For the majority of the film, he's portrayed as the main antagonist, but having the film end with him killing Saddam and restoring everything like that makes him seem more like an anti-hero. But even then, I think they could have stuck a little closer to their roots for the ending. This movie's depiction of Satan is one that I really enjoyed. Making him the most rational and sympathetic character in the movie was really funny, but I don't think it excuses the film's half-assed attempt at an ending. The other problem that I have with this movie is that I don't know when it is supposed to take place. Through context clues, I'm led to believe that this movie takes place before the series, and that this is where the boys first learned how to swear, something that they do consistently in the show. However, the film references some events that happened during the run of the show, like Kyle knowing that Ike is adopted and Canadian. Then there are things introduced here that are never brought up again in the show, like Kenny being a ghost and going to heaven, and Kyle being able to hack into a government system, as well as things that are straight up retconned, like Saddam Hussein appearing as a character in the Terrence and Philip show, in the episode Terrence and Philip and Not Without My Anus, but in the movie he exists in the real world. You could just disregard this film as not being canon to the show and just being its own separate thing, but the show references this movie in episodes like the new Terrence and Philip movie trailer. The trailer that the episode revolves around features a sequel to the movie featured in Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. I know that this movie was produced around the time when Kenny was still dying every week on South Park, but if your movie is going to be an adaptation of a TV show, I expect it to tie in with the show, especially when you're constantly referencing it throughout the movie. Yeah, I honestly could see how that would be a bit distracting. Luckily though, stuff like that is pretty forgivable as long as the movie holds up well. And this one does. It's probably one of the best film adaptations of a show ever. Yeah, South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut was not only a great adaptation, but a great film in its own right. Its themes were relatable and surprisingly well thought out, and its music desperately makes me want to own this film's soundtrack. I have a few issues with the film, like a few things I didn't find super hilarious, the poor ending, and the poor connection to the show, but I can easily look past them, and I still love the heck out of this film. It's rare for me to say something like this, but... I'd highly recommend seeing the movie first before seeing the first three seasons. While I wouldn't say I hate those seasons, they don't show the sheer brilliance behind South Park. This, in my opinion, would be the best introduction to the series, as well as from season 4 onwards. Hell, even Matt and Trey themselves admitted they weren't fans of the first three seasons. If anything, I'd argue this movie was where they found their groove. I agree wholeheartedly. This film, along with a few other episodes, would set the groundwork for South Park's future formula of making fun of people and topics relevant at the time. Without it, I doubt the show would still be in production today. There's a reason this show is considered a legend in Western animation. It knew what worked for it, and it knew how to discuss what it wanted to discuss without having to be manipulative or resorting to the least common denominator, something we're very accustomed to seeing in the majority of adult shows nowadays. And cry. But South Park is one of a kind, and it all starts here. And that about wraps up this video. 
Once again, I'd like to thank Jem for joining me for this one. Please go check out his channel if you haven't already, and be on the lookout for a video with me in it sometime in the near future. I know that I was going to post a big update video this week, but the video I was going to release it with got pushed back a week, so you're all going to have to wait an extra week for that. But trust me, you may find it pretty interesting. Anyway, remember to check out my Discord server and my Twitter, where I tease videos and hold polls that decide future ones. Jem is also on Twitter, so you can check him out if you like. With all that said, I'm Nintendo, and to end this video, here's Robin Williams singing Blame Canada. Oh my god, they killed Kenny! Times have changed, our kids are getting worse. They won't obey their parents, they just wanna fight and curse. Should we blame the government, or blame society? Or should we blame the images on TV? No! Blame Canada! Wrong, said Canada came along. We need to form a full.